As we continue to trace our phylogeny and the origin of each of our ancestral clades evidenced in the fossil record, we've advanced through each of the increments of geologic time until at this point we've come to the early Jurassic period in the middle of the Mesozoic era. Like all other such periods, the Jurassic begins and ends with mass extinctions. There's even a brief extinction event occurring within that period, but there's only one, and it's not the global cataclysm that some of the previous ones were. Neither is the one at the end. It's not one of the big five or six worst calamities ever. So it seems that we're past all that now. At this point, the world seems to have apparently stabilized. The former supercontinent of Pangaea is divided into two composite continents. What we know of today as Eurasia, which we think of as two continents for some reason, was then combined with North America to become the supercontinent Laurasia, while South America, India, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica were combined in a continental cluster called Gondwana. Interestingly, India was one of the first to separate from that collective, later becoming a northbound island continent, which would eventually collide with Asia. And that collision is still happening today. The crumple zone of that slow motion crash is the Himalayan mountain range, which is still rising by more than two inches a year. This is land that used to be on the sea floor, but is now being shoved skyward as the continents collide. And this is why you can still find seashells in the Himalayas. Tectonic plates were always fluid and are still moving today, albeit at about the same speed that your fingernails grow. For example, Africa is an enormous continent that is currently tearing itself in half, creating Victoria Falls in the Rift Valley. We'll talk about that in a later video. Contrary to some of our earliest impressions of the age of dinosaurs, the Jurassic period represents more than 50 million years of mild seasons toward the poles with no evidence of glaciers and indications of a warm but stable homogeneous climate otherwise. Thus, the world slowly recovered from the vast deserts of the Triassic extinction and gradually transformed into ideal greenhouse conditions, nurturing great abundance with lush forests and teeming waterways. In a sense, this was the best time to be alive because it was apparently the most abundant life on land had ever been. And that land belonged to the dinosaurs. While ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs dominated the seas and rhamphorhynchoids fluttered about in the air, there weren't any pterodactyloids yet. In the early Jurassic, pterosaurs were still small and awkward, refining their skills and learning how to master the skies. There were no birds yet either, not for a while, nor was there any grass. Instead, there were fields of horsetails that might have looked like meadows of grass. This was a different world. Even though much of it looked like a tropical rainforest, there were no palm trees, but there were ferns, ginkgos, and cycads, which grew to the size of trees back then, as well as the massive redwoods that now exist only in California. Today's temperate regions may have harsh winter conditions, but they used to be thick with primitive tropical trees that are now very rare and only found in exotic locations if they exist at all. We still have a few cycads, for example, but they don't grow as big as trees anymore. The living cycads rely on the breeze for pollination, but flying insects often help with that, developing a symbiotic relationship where both organisms become dependent on the other. Not that there were any bees or butterflies in the Jurassic either, but there were perilously similar things apparently filling that same niche. There were as yet no flowering plants either, so the cereals, herbs, and vegetables that we're used to didn't exist yet. There wasn't anything like that. No potatoes, tomatoes, or any familiar fruits or vegetables, and no spices, peppers, or seasonings at all other than just salt, because that's just a rock. So any time-traveling colonists who might want a Jurassic homestead would have to devise a whole different diet and without much flavor. Otherwise, it was an age of plenty, and every lineage was branching out and taking advantage of improving conditions. In the last episode, we talked about theriaforms. Now we'll look at subdivisions of them, starting with allotheria, specifically multituberculates. They get their name from the multiple rows of cusps in their grinding molars. Now some of these animals were arboreal and lived like prehistoric squirrels, eating nuts and seeds, and some of them had large bladed premolars that sliced through the husk before grinding the pulp. They also had large incisors like rodents, and they managed to hold out until the eventual rise of true rodents. Fossils found so far indicate that uh, multituberculates, a side branch of her own lineage, emerged in the late Jurassic and survived all the way until the Oligocene period more than a hundred million years later, making them one of the longest lasting race of mammals ever, even though they're all extinct now. In the early Jurassic, there were still other lines of therapsids that were older than mammals, but they too would die out before the end of that period, maybe because they couldn't compete with actual mammals who were more advanced. 
And searching for our own ancestry in the Jurassic is frustrating because the larger an animal is, the easier it is to fossilize. But our ancestors were all really small at that time. And then they lived in mostly forested conditions. And it's, it's easier to fossilize in a desert environment where a flash flood can bury something quickly. Uh, same in a beach environment. Animal bodies frequently wash up on the shore soon after they die and are quickly buried in the pounding waves, especially in extreme conditions like a tsunami or storm surge. But you have quite the opposite conditions on a moist forest floor. There, the bodies are not as likely to be buried and insulated quickly enough to uh, avoid acidic compounds and an abundance of microbes breaking down anything they can get to, so that very often only the enamel-covered teeth last long enough to fossilize. Fortunately, we can tell quite a lot from teeth. They're the most diagnostic feature of all of vertebrate paleontology. Look at Gondwanotheria, for example. All of these are known from fragments, no complete skeletons, and some of them are known only from their uniquely distinctive teeth. On that note, we look at our own clade, Holotheria, a word that means the whole of mammalia, which is funny because it doesn't include allotheres, monotremes, or triconodonts. <laughs> oh well. What had been established within Holotheria, again pertaining to the teeth, is a dental condition we humans still have. Some animals are monophodont, meaning they grow a single set of teeth, and if they lose them, they're toothless and starving to death. Others, like sharks, for example, can replace their teeth again and again by constantly growing new ones. But holotheres are diphodont, having two sets of teeth, or a replacement array. Because mammals suckle on mother's milk, they're often born toothless and begin developing milk teeth. So they fall out as the animal matures and are replaced by a backup set of rooted permanent teeth. But not every tooth does this. Incisors, cuspids, and canines have been shown to be diphonaut in earlier clades, but by the time we get to holotheres, that condition has spread even to premolars, meaning that true molars are the only monophodont teeth left. Now, since then, we've started growing baby teeth even for our first molars, but you still don't have any deciduous precursors for your hind molars, also known as your wisdom teeth. So, if you weren't born with permanent teeth, and you haven't replaced any of your teeth more than once each, other than artificially, of course, then if you have your third molars, then you should have wisdom enough to understand that that's one of the criteria for being holotherian.